you know, curvature. Okay, so if I want to characterize shape, I want to characterize the shape of my head, the shape of my fingers, I want to ask you then how far is it from something which is absolutely straight. So if I have a straight line, it's not curved at all, I want to characterize now how far it is from a straight object. And I can ask first about curves, thinking about an object which has one dimension which is very long and the other two dimensions which are very small. So mathematically, I may be able to abstract this as a curve, curve probably in the line, uh, in the plane, excuse me, or a curve which sits in three-dimensional space. And I'll do an, give you an example in just a minute. And one way to characterize the, the shape of this wiggly object in the plane is to ask what is the size of the circle at any location that just fits it locally, OK? So if I understand what the object is locally, uh, how large a circle is that I will need in order to fit the object locally, I know its radius of curvature. Or equivalently, I know the inverse of that. Mathematicians call it the curvature. The radius of curvature is inverse is the curvature. And, and it's defined in a very simple way. Forget about the fact that there's this strange looking beast over here, the limit. So it basically is defined by saying, I take a location at one point on the curve. I take another location at a neighboring point and see how much the curve is turned. Okay, so I move along the curve and I ask how, long the, how much the curve is turned. The amount of the curve is turned, I'm going to call delta theta, the change in the angle. And that's turned by an amount delta theta when I walk along it by an amount delta s. And I now want to ask, what is that as the distance to the point under consideration becomes smaller and smaller? This was an idea. It goes back to Leibniz and Newton, and they use this to essentially define curvature. And so the curvature will change from one location to the other. For example, over here, the curvature is very large because it's a straight line. So the radius of curvature, sorry, curvature is, yes, uh, very small, excuse me. The radius of curvature is very large, it's infinite. While over here, it's very strongly curved. For a circle, just so that you essentially have a measure, for a circle, this change in angle when I go around once is 2 pi, and the change in length is the circumference, which is 2 pi r, and so the curvature is exactly 1 over r. So that makes sense. What about a surface? So this is an example of a rather beautiful surface, uh, which was actually a crochet pattern. Um, in fact, I saw a book about this in Blackwell's just as I was walking here by the author Dinah Kaimina. And this, act, it turns out, is a, is a, this example Dinah Tamina made because she wanted to try and understand how to visualize a mathematical surface called a hyperbolic plane. But it turns out to have real bearing on what you see. If you go out now, it's spring over here, and you see the shape of leaves, you see flowers, you see the lily, for example, or the tulip, and you'll actually see the petals have a shape which is not dissimilar to this. Now this is not a curve anymore, this is a surface. And I want to try and ask exactly the same question. How do I characterize how curvy a surface is? And it turns out that I can essentially take the same definition for a line and generalize it to a surface. But now I'm going to ask, what is the solid angle? So if I have a plane curve, and I basically have a line over here, another line over there, I can ask, how much does that line rotate? If I wanted to ask the same question for a three-dimensional, two-dimensional surface sitting in three dimensions, I have to ask, what is the solid angle? What is the size of the cone that I essentially need in order to accommodate that little area, which I'm trying to characterize how strongly or how weakly curved it is? And so there is a quantity called the Gauss curvature, named after a very famous German mathematician, Carl Friedrich Gauss, and defined a perfect analogy with this formula as the limit when the change in the area goes to zero, when the area is going to zero, of the solid angle divided by the area. And again, for those of you who have a little bit of a difficulty trying to understand that, let me just think about a billiard ball. If I have a billiard ball, then the solid angle, which is the analog of the angle for a circle, the solid angle for a sphere is 4 pi, and the area of the sphere is 4 pi r squared. And so the Gauss curvature is essentially in this definition, 1 over r squared. And it's a positive quantity. So a sphere is positively curved. It's positively curved because the surface is falling away. If I draw a normal to a sphere, the surface is falling away from that normal in all directions. On the other hand, that's not always true for all surfaces. For example, over here, for a flat sheet, if I have the normal to the surface, the surface is not changing at all as I move away from that point. And so for this object, the radius of curvature goes to infinity, and the Gauss curvature goes to zero. So it's flat. Okay? So one would like to try and ask, 
Oh, I, I forgot to say something. Uh, these measures of curvature, they are intrinsic. They're intrinsic in that they don't really depend on where you are outside. They simply depend on what the shape of the surface is locally or the shape of the curve is locally. So if I were an ant and I was sitting on this surface and moving around, I would be able to measure this. And if I was an ant and I was sitting around over here, and I would be moving around and ask, well, what is my orientation relative to my neighbor? I would immediately know what the curvature is by just staying inside the surface. There are other measures of curvature which actually depend on where you are relative to the environment. Okay? And that leads me to essentially asking how one might quantify the nature, the, the nature of shape, which is the mathematics of shape, is quantified in terms of the geometry of surfaces and leads me to this second. So I told you already about this Gauss curvature, which is a very simple generalization of the curvature of a curve in the plane to surfaces. There's another object called the mean curvature. And let me define, let me un try and understand that or explain that to you by looking at three different examples. So this I just told you about. This is a flat sheet. I told you about this, which is a sphere. Gauss curvature is positive because the surface is falling away from any point, falling away from the normal in any direction that you move away from. This is a potato chip. OK, so if I have a potato chip, what happens to the potato chip? So I have the saddle-shaped surface, or a horse saddle. That's why it's called a saddle surface. So if I have the normal at a point, in one direction, the surface is coming towards the normal. In the other direction, it's falling away from the normal. OK, and it's fundamentally different from this and fundamentally different from that. And for that reason, this object actually has what is called negative Gauss curvature, because in one direction, it's curving away. In another direction, it's curving towards. So the Gauss curvature we understand. The mean curvature is essentially the average of the curvature in two directions. So if I essentially draw a line on the surface and I draw an orthogonal line at that same location and I ask how it's curved in one direction and another direction, then I can ask essentially how on average the surface is curved. A flat sheet has no curvature at all. This object potentially could be curved positively in one direction, negatively in the other direction, so that the mean curvature is zero. That's the shape of a soap film, for example. Okay, soap films have, on average, <coughs> mean curvature is zero, and the Gauss curvature is negative. So the mathematics of shape, the nature of shape, basically is trying to characterize these quantities, the Gauss curvature and the mean curvature. And if you want the physics, how this relates to reality, is to understand and ask the question, how does this curvature, how does shape change as a function of location and as a function of time? And as a mathematician, what I'd like to do, what our community likes to do, is to write down equations, for example, which tell you how the curvature changes in, in, for a curve. There's another quantity called the torsion. I'm happy to tell people about this later on. Or how the surface changes. So how, if I start out as, uh, in the case of a crumpled piece of paper, which is somewhere here, I start out with something which was flat, and I did something to it. And as I did something to it, the curvature changed. So the question that we'd like to ask is, how do these objects change as a function of location, and how do they change as a function of time? And in order to do that, we have to essentially use ideas from physics. We have to use ideas from engineering. We have to use notions and experiments from biology. And I'd like to spend the next 15, 20 minutes on understanding how, once we've been able to describe the shape, how can we understand how to prescribe the shape? How can I tell you what the laws are that essentially allow you to change shape? And if you're an engineer, how can I control it? That's, that's the dream. If I was thinking about the nature of shape, I want to now switch to the shape of nature. 